morning, almost afternoon, right? It's good to be here with everybody. Okay, before we get started though, can I tell you guys a secret? What just happened when I said that? Did you lean in just a little bit? Like, oh, my ears just perked up. Yep. Here's my beautiful family. I just had to brag on them for a little bit, so there they are. So yeah, when we hear that, right, we instantly kind of lean in a little bit and go, hmm, what is she going to tell me? Might be good, right? What happened when I was drawing tickets and I said, you aren't a loser yet? That was intentional. You didn't think it was. It was. What did you say to yourself? You'll be a loser later, right? When I hear that, I think back to words people have spoken to me that I am a loser, right? So then I think to myself, I'm not going to win. She's right. I'm already a loser. All right, so our words have power. Do you guys remember the game telephone? Back in the day where you'd stand in a line, right, and there'd be like five, six of you. Usually someone would tell you a tongue twister, and you'd have to pass it on down the line. What happened as that was passed on time after time? Talk to me, people. Come on. What happened? It changed right? Someone said, I kissed a boy, and I think he likes me, and at the end it turns into they're dating, and they're going to get married and have five kids, right? Something like that. All right, so my topic today is all about the power of our words. Are we tongue-tied, are we loose-lipped, or are we somewhere in between? What does that look like for us? So the next slide is some popular statements that I hope you guys can help me finish. If you don't have something nice to say, don't say nothing at all. That's from Bambi. Took me a while to remember that. That's Thumper saying that. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but... And it's not gossip if it's, if it's true. Okay? We have a lot of cutesy little phrases about words. Let's go to the next slide. What we really mean, though... Our sticks and stones may break my bones, but heartless words cut deeper. For wood and stone harm flesh alone, but language costs are steeper. Right? Why do we say that? I remember that as a kid on the playground, right? Someone said something to you. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. What was I trying to do? Self-defense, right? I'm trying to tell you that what you just said didn't hurt me, but it really did, so I'm going to try to make you not say anything more to me by saying that. All right. So some helpful definitions as we go into this topic. So gossip, quite a few different definitions for that. So it's casual or unconstrained conversation or reports about other people, typically involving details that are not confirmed as being true. Gossip is speaking to someone who is neither directly part of the problem or solution concerning another person who is not present. This one hit me really hard, so it's in bold. Everyday betrayal. Gossip is everyday betrayal. Judas betrayed Jesus, right? We think of how powerful that is in the Bible when he does that, and we're going, oh, how could he do that to Jesus who he spent time with? Everyday betrayal. And then other words. So we could say it's venting, sharing. Oh, I'm just processing. Oh, I just, I just need to vent about this situation. On the opposite end, we have encouraged, which is to give support or confidence or hope to someone, to give support and give advice so that they will do or continue to do something, right? That's what I do with my kids. When I potty train, it doesn't matter if they get the teeniest, teensy bit of pee in that potty, they get M&Ms, okay? It does not matter how small I encourage them, and eventually over time, that encouragement gives them the ability to do it, Okay? Um, another funny story about that. So someone encouraged me once in my life, and it sounded really weird when he said it to me. He said I was a wooden spoon. I was like, what? What does that even mean? And he said, it's because you will feed multitudes. You are such a good hostess. You bring people in, and you love on them, and you feed them, and you give them encouragement. But you're not afraid to hit them over the head with that wooden spoon either. <laughs> but it resonated with me. I went, yeah, I'm a wooden spoon. I like want to get one and carry it with me everywhere. 
So encouragement doesn't always mean that we're not saying, it doesn't mean nice things all the time. It doesn't mean, oh, I love your sweater. Although that's nice, that's not what encouragement really is. To help or stimulate or to develop. So again, coming alongside someone and doing it with them to encourage them in what they're trying to do. And then integrity. I think this is a word that's kind of lost on our culture right now, so I want to just remind us, what does it mean to be a woman of integrity? It's the quality of being honest and having strong moral principles, moral uprightness, the state of being whole and undivided, the condition of being unified, unimpaired, or sound in construction. Right? Occasionally, if you see a building project, oh, that project has good integrity. Basically saying it has a good foundation, right? All right, I like to make you guys work. So here's a list of questions, and I'm going to give you guys a little bit of time to think of them. So I'm going to say all the questions. You do not have to answer all of them to yourself. That's too much pressure. Pick a few that when you hear them, you go, ooh, I need to think about that. Or, oh, I know that one. What words has someone spoken to you in the last week that encouraged you? Has that happened? Has someone ever spoken into your life in such a profound way that you always remember it or call it to mind often? For example, a mother, a grandmother, an aunt, a coach, a teacher, someone in your life that said something to you and it stuck with you for years and years and years. What does it mean to be a woman of integrity when it comes to our speech, to our words? What words do you wish you heard more often in your life? What are the words you're lacking? to hear. Do you ever hesitate to, show, to share words of encouragement? Do you ever hesitate to share your faith? And in the last week, have you used your words to build up or encourage someone? What would it look like if your words were tattooed on the people you spoke to or didn't speak to, spoke behind their back? What would that look like? So I just want to be really clear before we keep going is that there's a difference between gossip and inviting someone alongside of you to help you in your life, okay? So I found this definition of process and I thought it was really good. It means I'm talking to the right person, the person who can help me about the right thing to accomplish the right end result, right? So it's intentional who we share our life with and what that looks like, okay? Let's go to the next slide. How does this image make you feel? So it's a, a lady who has words of encouragement spoken on her. It says she's loved, she's smart, she's strong, funny, confident. Feels pretty good, right? What words would you tattoo on yourself? What words do you use to describe yourself? And what does that look like? Because whether they're tattooed on you or not, how you believe about yourself is how you carry yourself throughout every single day. All right, let's go to the, well, really quick. I found this study. I just saw it on my page, and I wanted to remind you guys. They have actually done studies on plants. And plants that are spoken to in loving words grow faster and stronger than other plants. There's actually a Mythbusters episode. You can find it on YouTube. One, they play rock music, like really loud, obnoxious, classical music in a different greenhouse, words of love in one, and words of hate in the other, and the plants grow differently. It's a plant. It doesn't have a brain. I hope you don't think that. If you do, we'll talk later. Um, but a plant responds to words, okay? All right, now let's do the opposite. What words has someone spoken to you in the last week that were hurtful? Are there hurtful words that were spoken to you so often that you believe them and they became part of your identity? Have you ever participated in gossip? Have you seen gossip ruin a relationship or a reputation? Have you been hurt by gossip, lies, or rumors? What words might others use to describe you that you would not choose for yourself? And again, this image, right? If I spoke hurtful words and they were tattooed on the person, what would that look like? So in this picture, the girl's words are broken, too fat, too skinny, not enough, stupid, sinful, rude. 
it's pretty powerful to think of our words being tattooed on someone. So do you guys know anyone who's lost their lives due to gossip or rumors? Suicide, right? Bullying, cyberbullying is rampant in our youth right now. It's so easy to say words, not to their face, but over a text message, over Facebook, over Instagram, Snapchat. I could go on and on with the different apps they use. Right? People die over this. Jews in the Holocaust. Right? How did Hitler rise to power? He was a great speaker. He could rally the troops behind him to get him to believe what he believed. Our words are so powerful. All right. So I want to share some scripture with you on what God has to say on words. And it's going to look like a lot. This is probably about half, maybe a quarter of what I found about what God had to say about our words. So in the book of James alone, here's what God has to say. James 1.19, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. James 1.26, those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. Our tongue can make our religion worthless if we don't use it correctly. James 3, 3 through 6. This is kind of long, so bear with me. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. No human can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. And then in James 3, 9 through 12, with the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth comes praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? And then there's more scripture on it. Look at this, guys. Proverbs has a lot to say about it. You can read that book and find a lot more than what I put here. But Proverbs 18.21, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Proverbs 26.30, without wood, a fire will go out, and without gossip, quarreling will stop. Proverbs 5.28, the heart of the righteous weighs its answers, but the mouth of the wicked gushes evil. Gushes. Think of a fire hydrant, right? When they let it go to get the water out. I don't really know what the process is. Amy could probably fill me in, but flushing. There we go, and they're flushing the hydrant. Have you ever seen that? Right? Gushy. Gushes evil. Matthew 12, 36, I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. Not some of them, all of them. Matthew 15, 18, but what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. Our mouth is not independent from our head and our heart, is it? What we think, what we feel, what comes out in between, the mouth, right? Right? Proverbs 11:13 A gossip betrays a confidence but a trustworthy person keeps a secret. And Proverbs 10:19 Sin is not ended by multiplying words but the prudent hold their tongues. So I think sometimes we think gossip only happens in school or the workplace. But I tell you what, gossip happens in the family. And gossip happens in the church. But we like to cover it up a little bit. Okay? I cover up gossip in the church when I say, Amy, I just have to tell you about what so-and-so told me because I think they really need prayer on that. Sometimes we use prayer as a cover for gossip. It's not good. The church is just as guilty as the coffee club that meets at a mini mart here. Guys do it. Women do it. Children do it. And we like it. There's something about a secret that piques our interest and gets our adrenaline going. So typically I give the whole sermon, but as I was researching this, I came across this video and it covered what I wanted to say even better than I could say it. So we're going to watch that and then I'll come back after, okay? Just about everybody that you encounter 
is often going through something that may not be obvious from the outside, but they're facing a battle on the inside. Everyone that you come across is facing some type of battle in their life. I hope that you'll embrace that you have no idea what God might do through a single word of encouragement. You have no idea how God could use you to offer someone hope, to build someone's faith. And I don't know about you, but there is so much negativity in the world today. I can't open up my social media feed without being discouraged. I can't read a news app without just being depressed. I can't talk to people with all the heartbreaking news in the world without being disheartened. And so many people in a polarized world can be so incredibly critical, so undeniably hateful. I think it's time that we as believers step in and lift others, bring words of hope, bring words of encouragement, because the words we speak are filled with power. Our words can build up or our words can crush. In fact, scripture says in Proverbs 18, 21, that the tongue has the power of life and of death. I want my words to build your faith to strengthen your confidence, to believe that God is for you, that he's with you, that he'll never leave you, he'll never forsake you, he's working in you. If it were up to me, I would encourage you and build your faith because everyone, you see, is facing a battle that you don't know anything about. The scripture tells us that life and death is in the power of the tongue. That makes total sense. Because if you'll just take stop for one second and look back over your life, I guarantee you that every one of us in this room have got at least one incident in our life where we know we have seen the power of the tongue produce death. Death to relationships, death to jobs. How many people you know have been fired because of their mouth? How many marriages have been destroyed because of mouths, because of the tongue? So let's use our words to benefit us. Let's use our words to make the world around us better. Let's use our words to make our relationships better. Let's, make, let's use our words to bring life to our marriage, life to our kids, life to our jobs, life to our minds, life to our families. Speak words that edify, speak words that build up, speak words that embrace, speak words that forgive, speak words that love, speak words that heal. Words are full of power. They can heal, they can wound. They can minister death, they can minister life, they can encourage, they can discourage, they can build up, they can tear down. People get divorces over words. Families are split apart over words. People lose jobs over words. People have insecurity and a poor self-image over words that have been spoken to them. Words are containers for power. And we need to choose our words very carefully. And it's time for us to step up to the plate and be accountable for the words that we allow to come out of our mouth. No man can tame the tongue. We need God's help. So you want to pray every day for God to help you with your mouth. We, we are constantly speaking words and even a few can have the power of life and death. Now, some of you know this because you grew up in homes where a few words spoken to you had power of life or had power of death. And you can remember those words, just three or four words that maybe a parent, a teacher, a sibling, a friend, a coach said to you, and it either brought some life or it brought some death into your world. One of the best things you can do for your relationships, if you're married, if you have children, if you're a leader or an influencer at work, if you have someone in your, in your small group, is to bless them with words of encouragement. Set the blessing free. You encourage what you want to see, and you typically see more of it. If it were up for me, up to me, I would be so encouraging. If you think something good, say it. If you think something good, say it. In a world full of so much criticism, so much hatred, so much disappointment, so much negativity, as people of the light, we'll lift up others around us.
So Genesis 1, the Bible tells us the earth was formless, it was empty, or it was a void. And it says that darkness was over the surface of the deep. So there was, there was just nothing. There was nothing. And then verse 3, here's what we read. <clears throat> and God said. Maybe your translation says, and God spoke. So God speaks into the nothingness. He speaks into the darkness. And he says, let there be light. And there was light. And so at the very beginning of time, God creates the universe, but how does he do it? What tool does he use? He, he uses words. He speaks the universe into existence. God says, and it is. And we see this throughout the creation account. God said, and it, and it, and it happened. He speaks it. And so God uses words to bring about life and light. God uses words to build up, to, to create. He speaks into darkness and he says light and lights come on. And so we see from the beginning the power of words, that words are the tool that God uses. Flip over a couple chapters, Genesis 3. And in this passage, uh, we see the, that words have the power of death. And so this is the passage of scripture where sin enters into the world. Um, God has created man and woman. He said that it's very good. Now Satan comes on the scene in the form of a serpent. And verse one tells us that the serpent was clever, more clever in fact than any wild animal God had made. And what did he do? He spoke. He spoke to the woman and he said, do I understand that God told you? So he speaks and when he speaks, he attacks what God has said. And do, do I understand that God told you not to eat from any tree in the garden? And then he would go on to say, hey, God didn't really say that. And so what does the enemy use? The enemy uses words to bring death to where there was life and to bring darkness to where there, is, there was light. Now here's what's interesting, of course, is that the serpent's words were not true, but that didn't keep his words from having power, right? Like the moment Eve, Adam and Eve, speak the words in their own hearts, the moment they believe those words, they give life to them. They empower them. So God speaks, the serpent speaks, and we just see from the beginning, there's the power of life, there's the power of, of, of death. God speaks and he creates and he builds and he blesses. The enemy speaks and he tempts and he accuses, he deceives, he destroys. It's hardwired into the universe, the power of, of words. Am I, am I speaking life or am I speaking death into the world around me? You know, it's so amazing, the power of this tongue. In James chapter 3, he illustrates it this way. In verse 3, he says, When you put bits into the mouth of horses to make them obey, you can turn the whole animal. He goes, or take ships as an example. Though they're large and driven by strong winds, they're steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person. It sets the whole course of his life on fire and is itself set on fire by hell. My tongue right now could be set on fire by hell. What does he mean by that? That Satan himself could influence what I have to say. The words coming out of his mouth could come straight from hell itself. And any time I use this mouth to tear someone down, guess who's in control of my tongue at that minute? Hell. Anytime I use this mouth to do anything but bring glory to God, who's using this? When I'm bringing glory to myself, who's using this? It's Satan. He's got control of it. You and I, we have the ability to have our tongues set on fire by hell to say things that will actually pull people away from God. It's a dangerous thing. That's what this passage is about. It's like, do you know how powerful you are? And in and, and, uh, and verse 9, he says, And with this tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who've been made in God's likeness. And what this verse says is, can't praise God with your mouth and also curse men 
And then he says, who have been made in the likeness of God. And what this passage is saying is, do I ever have a right to curse anyone that was made in the image of God? And I don't want God seeing me on this earth cursing someone that he loves. It's about love. You're call, you don't have a right to hate anyone that God created and use this mouth to curse anyone that God wants saved. I mean, really, the heart of God is Romans 5, 8, of that while we were sinners, that God demonstrated His love for us and Christ died for us. Not because we were so lovable, but he looks down and goes, wow, these people are rebelling against me, but I love them, and I love them so much that I'm going to pursue them. It's not about God looking down and going, man, look at them rebel against me. I'm going to curse them. No, instead, I'm going to send my son down and show love to them and save them. And in the same way, as a reflection of Jesus Christ, I'm supposed to look at those who are antagonistic toward God and love them and pursue them and save them and pray for them but not curse them um, you know he uses this idea of he says out of the same mouth you know verse 10 out of the same mouth come praise and cursing my brothers this should not be He goes, you can't use this mouth to praise and curse understand when we became a believer we said God here here here's my tongue and then every once in a while I go, wait, God, give, let me get my tongue back for a second. Let me use it. I'm going to let Satan borrow it for a little bit. Here, Satan, go ahead. Okay, use my tongue now. Let me gossip. Let me say some things that aren't true. Let me slander some people. Let me put some people down. Let me, you know, do this, do that with this tongue. And then we come back. Okay, God, I'm done with it. You can have it back. You just, you just, you just gave that to Satan? to borrow for a little bit and then you give it back to me and you take it back he goes you can't use the same you can't let us both use his tongue man whose is it out of the same mouth you can't have blessing and cursing why do blessing and cursing come out of your mouth because there's blessing and cursing in your heart you need a new heart you need God to change who you are this message is not about biting your tongue and offering lip service. I need you to change my heart. I don't want anything to come out of this mouth that doesn't honor you. This tongue was created by God. God made it. Colossians 1.16 says, All things were created by Him and for Him. Why did God make this tongue? To praise Him. I really believe that we open doors for the enemy through complaining. God gave us our mouth for one reason, and that's to glorify Him. You have a mouth to glorify God. Amen? And that's what we need to use it for. I think so often we talk more about what the enemy is doing than we do about what God's doing. We don't need to talk fear. We need to talk faith. Why? Because our words are powerful. Our words are containers for power. Your words can carry your faith to the kingdom of God and release angels to help you, or your words can carry your fear to the kingdom of darkness and just release more trouble in your life. And, and what would happen if certain words that we spoke to people, they would just show up on that person and they were just always there? We would be careful with the words we spoke because we, we wouldn't take them lightly. We would understand the impact that they had, that they, they don't just go away. And the Bible helps us understand that, that our words have that kind of, of power. And most of us could probably give some examples of words that were spoken to us that have been tattooed on us in some way or another. And they were spoken perhaps impulsively or carelessly or thoughtlessly. The Bible says, Proverbs 12, 18, the words of the reckless, the words of the thoughtless, the, the, the words of the careless pierce like swords. They, they do more damage than we realize, but the tongue of the wise does what? It, it, it brings healing. And so with our mouth, we can destroy, or with our mouth, we can heal, and we can bring life. That through Jesus, he can speak life where there is death. He, he can speak light into darkness. His word is more powerful than any other word. Any word that you've said to yourself, any word that's been spoken to you, his word 
His word overrides that. And so we listen to his word and we speak his word and then we believe his word and then we watch and we see what God does. So I know that repeated some of the things that I said, but it's so good for us to hear things over and over again. That's how they, they speak to us, right? If you hear that, I just think of my son. So one day he came home from school and he started playing with his ears a lot. And I'm like, what is going on here? And his ears do stick out a little bit. Well, kids at school are calling him monkey ears. He had never touched his ears prior to that, right? But that was spoken on him. And now when he thinks of his ears, that's what he thinks of. So we take words and we make them our identity and we respond according to that instead of the power that God has given us, the identity that he's given us. And that's hard. I am not good at this, guys. Ask my small group. I am not good at holding my tongue, okay? And I'm not great at offering encouragement. When my son does something wrong or my kids do something wrong, I'm like, why do you have to do that? And I'm speaking words that are not positive. So I don't want you to walk away from here like, wow, Megan has it all together. I am probably worse at this than anyone in this room. That would be my own interpretation of myself. Um, So how will you use your words? Here's some scripture on what God tells us to do with our mouth, the opposite of what he says not to do. Psalm 6930, I will praise God's name in song and glorify him with thanksgiving. In Psalm 9 verse 1, I will give thanks to you, Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of all your wonderful deeds. I was really convicted in that video when it said that. When someone asks me how my day is going or how my life is, what do I instantly go to? Man, I was on my way to work and this happened. Or um, just the kids did this and I'm just really frustrated. Or I'm just so busy all the time. I don't have time for all these things I want to do. Right? The first thing that exits my mouth is complaining. Then what do you want to do? You want to complain back, right? I know. Me too. And then we're both complaining together and that's not glorifying to God. Ephesians 5, 18 through 20, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I don't remember the last time I sang a a hymn to Sharon. I might have to walk up to her tomorrow at church and start singing hymns to her. Um, But again, just that idea of we're praising God together, we're lifting each other up, we're encouraging them towards the Lord. And I'm not going to read the rest of those, um, but for your reference, if you want them, they're Philippians 4, 6 through 7, and Romans 10 through 14, or sorry, chapter 10, verse 14. So the next slide, let us seek to build others up, not tear them down. I really want you guys to think of someone you can encourage this week. And you know what it takes? It takes being really diligent to observe them right? You have to observe them doing something and then encourage them in it. That's hard. It takes work to encourage someone. It's not as easy as it might sound. And then uh, just closing thought, the last uh, scripture I want to share in Psalm 141 verse 3, it says, set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the doors of my lips. This should be prayed daily for us because I don't think anyone is great at controlling the tongue. It's just a very hard little thing in our body that's very hard to control. So I want to pray for us in regards to this, and then Heather will come up. So, God, I'm just so thankful that we have a tongue to praise you. But so often, God, we use it to tear each other down, to spread gossip. And I pray, God, that we would not perk up when we hear that someone has a secret or a little bit of information to share with us, God. Help us to be wise in that. Help us to to truly just share your goodness with a world that's already broken and hurting. Let us tell of the good deeds you're doing in our own life and in the world around us. And Lord, your Bible is just full of your word. That's how we live our life is based on what you spoke. So let us live it well. Amen.